by every metric, the military of the United Arab Emirates is considered to be the best of all the Arab world. It grew from a couple hundred militiamen in the 1970s to a staggering 65,000 soldiers in 2022, as many as Canada. The United Arab Emirates, the UAE, can also afford the best military equipment. It is estimated that they spend 22 billion US dollars a year on defense, about the same as Israel or Turkey. In the past 10 years, the UAE also increased its projection of power to secure its assets and interests when combat missions in Yemen and in Libya. The country even had a military base in Eritrea and is now planning to build a new one in Somaliland. But what makes the Emirati Armed Forces special is that their top ranking commander is from Australia. Not only that, he's also in personal command of the Presidential Guard. It's so rare. How many other countries can you think of that have a foreigner in such an important position? The UAE, the military of the UAE is truly a mystery. How did they manage to achieve this success story with just over 1 million Emirati citizens? How did the United Arab Emirates build one of the top armies in the world from scratch with no prior military experience? And before we dig into that, a quick word from our sponsor. I'm presenting you today's sponsor, Crossout. Crossout is an online post-apocalyptic vehicle shooter which allows you to create and test your own designs on the battlefield. Available for free on PC, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, and Xbox Series S or X. You can build your own improvised tank armed with anything ranging from machine guns to rocket launchers and chainsaws. Whether you want to battle against AI in the PvE mode or test your concepts against other players' designs in PvP, there's plenty to try. There's even a narrative-driven campaign if you want something with a little more story. I've always enjoyed games of this style, since it really lets you experiment compared to real-world designs, especially when you add in dynamic damage rather than health points. So go ahead and try out the game yourself. By using the link in my description below, you'll get a great bonus including the unique pixel paint, a choice between a selection of three weapons and a powerful vehicle cabin. Many, many problems. The United Arab Emirates face an unusual situation. Although the total population is just under 10 million people, 89% of the population is made of expats, mostly male foreign workers from South Asian countries such as India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Thus, Emirati citizens only represent 11% or 1,150,000 people. And that's a huge problem if you want to have a strong military. That means that they only have a recruitment pool of around 360,000 males fit for service. In response in 2014, the UAE introduced a 12-month conscription for men. Every year, military training centers can accommodate between 5,000 and 7,000 conscripts. That's not a lot, and experts believe that conscription has only played a limited role in enhancing the UAE's military capabilities. Overall, the goal of military service was to scout for high-quality personnel and convince them to enlist after the 12-month period. However, only 8% of conscripts, roughly 400 to 600 men, transitioned to the regular military. It's not surprising, because of the oil industry, most Emiratis are born in wealth. They have little economic incentive for self-sacrifice and do not find the rigors of military life appealing. So you can see how despite good intentions, the Emirati forces still face a severe shortage of manpower. But beefing up the military was not the only reason behind conscription. It was also meant to instill some sort of Emirati identity. The UAE is a relatively new country. It was officially formed in 1976 with the Union of Seven Emirates the most powerful ones being Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Not only were seven emirates glued together, but within each emirate you have many tribes that are each separated with multiple families. The volunteers going to the military usually come from the northern emirates, which are less populous and far less wealthy than Abu Dhabi and Dubai. In the past decade, if the northern emirates account for around 25% of the UAE's population, they represent nearly 40% of all Emirati military personnel. For middle class Emiratis, service in the military is a family business. They push their sons throughout the force structure. Then they can rise to the ranks with the support and protection of their brothers, cousins and members from the same tribe. 
In contrast, the officer corps mainly comes from Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Of course, better education might be a factor that explains this disparity. But family name and the nobility status, asil, are often the most important factor. Often more important than the rank of the officer. In the UAE, it happens that a senior officer will take orders from a junior officer or even an NCO if he comes from a better ranked family or tribe. In reality, such situations are very rare, since most senior commanders secure their rank through family connections. For loyalty reasons, most sensitive positions in the Emirati military are filled with members of Abu Dhabi tribes. Prestige and honor play an important role in Emirati culture. Foreign observers noted that Emirati officers will never admit when things go wrong because their honor would take a hit doing so. For example, there was an Emirati unit that had performed badly in Yemen. A new brigadier was appointed to refit the unit. He analyzed a situation and wanted to get rid of numerous officers that were considered part of the problem. When he did so, those officers appealed to their tribal leaders, the Sheikh, who appealed to the political leadership. And in the end, the new brigadier was transferred. This is where now President Mohammed bin Zayed steps in. When he was still Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, within 15 years, he completely reformed the country. And he applied the same economic principles that made the UAE so successful to the military. He knew that if he wanted the United Arab Emirates to play an important role in the future, that the Emirati armed forces would have to adapt to modern warfare and overcome a lot of obstacles related to Arab society, Western officers. The UAE did something that no other country did in modern times. They hired Western officers to personally take command of their most prestigious and elite military units. Australian Major General Mike Hindmarsh took over the 12,000 strong Presidential Guard and former US Army Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Tumajan is now head of the UAE's Joint Aviation Command, aka the Air Force. And there are many, many others just like them. For example, John McDonnell, the retired two-star Army General who served in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's been working in Abu Dhabi since February 2018 as a senior advisor for the Emirati Army. Over the past seven years, 280 American military retirees received federal authorization to work for the United Arab Emirates. In reality, that number is much higher. Americans who serve fewer than 20 years in uniform do not have to seek federal permission to take foreign jobs as civilian contractors. Analysts estimate that 1,000 U.S. officers and NCOs are employed by the Emirati government one way or another. Likewise, a high number of former members of the Australian SAS and commandos now work for the Emiratis. And not surprisingly, a lot of them are attached to the Presidential Guard. British and French advisors have also been reported. Oh, talking about the French, little side note. The UAE fields 354 French AMX-56 Leclerc tanks. So we can assume that they need French specialists for maintenance. France is also present to teach Emirati forces tactical skills and how to use the Leclerc in combat arms operations. In this case, we're not talking only about private contractors since the UAE hosts a 700 strong French military base since 2009, which most likely provide the necessary help already. Among the civilian contractors, 14% of American officers were hired by an Emirati company called Knowledge Point. They're tasked with training, educating, and advising Emirati forces. But there's more than just military experience that all this personnel can bring to the UAE. Think about it. It's true that all these Western officers went through NATO training, but they also bring a meritocracy mindset that the UAE so desperately needs. By being outsiders, Westerners aren't bound to all the families and tribes. There won't be any nepotism either. Major General Hindmarsh can't make his son become an officer in the UAE army. That's why their most important job is helping the Emirati leadership identify its best soldiers and officers and help them move up the chain of command by merit and not merely swap the officer corps with those with the best family connections. There's also a darker political reason as to why the UAE might want an Australian in charge of the presidential guard. A foreigner will never attempt a coup against the government and take power for himself. The scenario of some military guys overthrowing the government has plagued Arab armies for decades and with a foreign commander, it really limits such an outcome. 
Meanwhile, another Emirati defense contractor called Global Aerospace Logistics also employs a lot of Westerners. Since 2015, this state-owned company has hired more than 100 retired US military personnel, mostly Air Force and Army veterans with aviation backgrounds. The Emiratis also depend on American mechanics to teach them how to use and maintain an extensive arsenal of specialized US-built weaponry, such as F-16 fighter jets, Predator drones, Patriot missile batteries, and THAAD missile interceptors. You might ask, why are so many foreigners willing to work for the UAE? Don't think too much, the answer is simple. The Emiratis pay well. Former US enlisted personnel working in the UAE, like mechanics, welders, even painters, can earn up to 100,000 US dollars per year tax-free. And as your rank increases, so does your pay. A retired senior chief petty officer from Navy SEAL Team 6 received a $348,000 salary plus $54,000 for housing and travel to work in the UAE as a firing range trainer. Meanwhile, a retired US Army colonel accepted a $324,000 a year job as an advisor for the Emirati Army. And here, Daniel Baltrizaitis, a retired Air Force colonel, moved to Abu Dhabi to become dean of the college with a $338,000 salary and a $53,000 in housing perks. The reason why the United Arab Emirates can afford all this is also very simple. They can hire people for as little as 90 days or a few years, but they have no responsibility for them once the contract is over. No pensions, no health benefits, nothing. And it worked. They managed to get the best of the best to train their military. So the UAE solved the problem for the officer corps. But what about ground forces? Since we know that they face such a severe lack of manpower. Boots on the ground. Now the only thing missing for the Emirati armed forces is guys with AKs attacking enemy positions. During the country's intervention in Yemen, it is believed that 15,000 Emiratis were deployed. But really 1,500 troops took part in ground operations. And most of them as part of the presidential guard. As a response to the lack of foot soldiers, the Emirati leadership thought of simply deploying conscripts abroad to guard rear operating bases and ammunition depots to free up combat personnel and it's low risk since they're far from the front. However, in September 2015, 52 Emirati conscripts guarding a weapons depot were killed by a Toshka missile. That's 1% of all conscripts of that year gone within a day. As of now, this was the bloodiest day in Emirati history. And as you can imagine, it caused an upheaval in the UAE. Compared to that, hiring foreign contract soldiers is a relatively cheap alternative, especially since there's no social condemnation in the event of casualties if deployed abroad. The Emirati Armed Forces have hired 15,000 Sudanese troops they brought in to help fight the war in Yemen. General Haftar was one of the UAE's close ally in the region. And at least 4,000 Sudanese contractors were also sent to protect oil installations in Libya, with 1,000 of them guarding Benghazi in eastern Libya. Reportedly, they were meant to guard Emirati oil infrastructure to free up Haftar's militiamen so that he could advance against Tripoli. However, just like with everything in the UAE, your passport is very important. There's a hierarchy of foreign fighters depending on their country of origin. Emirati convoys and bases in Yemen typically employ the triple screen of security. The outermost layer consisted of Yemeni militiamen trained, paid, and armed by the UAE. The Sudanese sort of replaced the Emirati conscripts and served as security for military bases. But at times, Sudanese troops acted as low-quality line fillers or salt elements <coughs> cannon fodder <coughs> in support of Emirati mechanized formations and their Yemeni militia allies that carried the bulk of the fighting. Lastly, the inner perimeter was banned by Emiratis. Overall, it's very similar to what the Americans did in Iraq and Afghanistan. Bengalis also accompanied UAE forces in Yemen, but they were not fighters. They were the ones setting up the tents, carrying the water, and performing a set of low-skilled tasks. It was also reported that Indians and Bengalis were spotted in large numbers at an Emirati base in Socotra, but I had no information as to what tasks they were doing there. But since there's no fighting on the island, I don't think that their job was meant to be as combat units. The UAE also hired a lot of Vietnamese discharged military personnel. Here is a footage of a group of 73 of them that were hired by the UAE from 2010 to 2013. 
The total number of Vietnamese recruited during that period is unknown. If you pay close attention, these Vietnamese contractors carried nearly exclusively AK-style rifles, to be exact, the Bulgarian AR-M9, while their desert digital camouflage uniforms seemed to be made in Vietnam. But I think this AR-M9 was the standard issue rifle for most Emirati auxiliary forces, namely the thousands of Yemeni militiamen that the UAE recruited had the same weapon. I don't know, I also find it very interesting how they managed to make an army with people from all over the world. However, the recruits that got the most recognition came from Colombia. You see, Colombian soldiers spent decades battling FARC rebels in the jungles of Colombia. They're very good at guerrilla warfare, spec ops, and helicopter operations. And with this solid military experience, they're preferred over other Latin American soldiers. And here's the thing, the Colombian government has a hard time retaining its military personnel because Abu Dhabi offers them six times their regular salary. Each year, up to 11,000 Colombian soldiers reach the end of their contract, therefore building a sizable pool of highly trained recruits for the United Arab Emirates. Now, Turkish media claims that 30,000 mercenaries from four Latin American countries were hired by the UAE. Knowing them, it's most likely an exaggeration. And it's not clear. 30,000 over the span of how many years? One year? 10 years? Are they really all from Latin America or it's like mercenaries in general? What we do know is that in 2015, the New York Times revealed that 450 Latin American troops, mostly Colombians, along with some from Panama, Chile, El Salvador, had been contracted by the UAE to fight Uthi rebels in Yemen. They were deployed after having received desert training by US contractors. And after that first group, the UAE hired another 3,300 Latin Americans who arrived in Yemen in batches. These Latin American recruits were paid between 2,000 and 3,000 US dollars a month and a $1,000 a week bonus for the ones deployed directly to Yemen for the toughest missions. Honestly, it can be quite profitable for a lot of ex-military personnel, especially if your pension is a couple hundred dollars a month. However, there is also a risk that comes with this wage of fear. For example, in December 2017, an ambush by Yemeni al-Usi rebels left 14 contractors KIA, 10 of which were Colombian, but also two from the UK, one French citizen and another from Australia. For the UAE though, it was 14 names less to inscribe on the memorial. Same story for the Sudanese. One of the units suffered 200 casualties out of a group of 600. So you can see just currently how important these foreign contractors are to the Emirati military and to the geopolitical ambitions of the country. We mentioned earlier how the UAE hired thousands of Yemeni militiamen. But according to a UN report, they also recruited 1,500 Arab tribesmen from Chad and many others from Niger to fight in Yemen as Emirati soldiers. Allegedly, the story goes that they were promised simple security jobs in the UAE for $500 a month, 10 times the average monthly salary. And then they found themselves with an AK in the middle of the Yemeni desert. Overall, it is hard to estimate how many of the 65,000 military personnel of the Emirati Armed Forces or foreigners. But let's try to get an answer. The UAE is similar to the other rich Gulf states in the large number of foreign contract soldiers it has employed. Qatar's military has 85% foreigners, many of them from Somalia. Kuwait stands between 50 and 80%. Bahrain, 65% contract soldiers, mostly from Pakistan. And according to the Carnegie Middle East Center, at least 70% of enlisted personnel in the UAE are foreigners, mainly from Oman and Yemen. Now let's try to do our own educated guess. We know that the Air Force, the Navy, and the Presidential Guard are all Emiratis. Then remove around 6,000 conscripts and around 2,000 special forces that are also 100% Emirati. 39,000 positions remain, or 60% of the total. And going in the same direction, Andreas Craig, professor of security studies at King's College London, estimated that foreigners make up 40% of Emirati armed forces, around 26,000 contract soldiers. Perhaps once again, the Turkish media was not so wrong after all. But the UAE is not very transparent with their military, so that's as far as we can go. In the end, the UAE knows history. And they still want a fully Emirati military structure. But if they can achieve this for their officer corps, it is still evident that they need foreigners in their military. 
especially for the rank and file, just like they do in their regular economy. The political ambitions of the UAE are simply too big for what the Emirati citizens can give. Thank you to Crossout for sponsoring this video. Get Crossout now using my link in the description and secure yourself some cool bonuses.